Before the early 20th century, scientists believed that the Earth was a hard, solid sphere and that the continents were solidly attached upon its rigid surface. Movement of the Earth's surface was thought to be confined to the occasional rise and fall of the rock layers that form the continents. In 1912, a German scientist named Alfred Wegener proposed a theory which changed the way scientists around the world viewed the Earth. The process he described was nothing short of revolutionary. Wegener proposed that the Earth's surface was not static, but dynamic. He maintained that the whole crust was in motion on a global scale, constantly changing the shape and size of the continents and oceans. It's easier to understand Wegener's theory if we look at a model of the cross-section of the Earth. This cross-section reveals four major parts, the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. The crust varies in depth from 10 to 30 kilometers. It is thinnest under the oceans and thickest under the mountain ranges of the continents. The crust contains essentially two kinds of rock. The upper layer consists largely of granite rock. Granite is relatively light in color and low in density and is the most common material of which the continents are formed. The other main material of the crust is a denser, darker rock called basalt. Basalt rock forms the floor of the oceans as well as a subsurface layer under the continents. Beneath the crust lies the mantle which is about 2,900 kilometers thick. The mantle is composed of hot rock that is denser than the basalt of the crust. The pressure of the crust over the mantle keeps most of it in a solid or nearly solid state, despite its high temperature. When mantle material oozes through holes in the crust, it becomes molten and liquid. We see it then as the lava that flows from volcanoes such as Mount Etna. The other two regions of the Earth's interior are the outer core, which appears to be fluid, and the inner core, which is thought to be solid. Most scientists of Wegener's time believed that the changes in the Earth's crust resulted primarily from vertical shifts. Evidence of such vertical movement is present throughout the world. Layers of sedimentary rock, which are built up horizontally, are often found to be folded or else tilted and broken. These displacements suggest that powerful forces have caused vertical movement after the rock hardened. Other important evidence came from the discovery at high elevations of sedimentary rocks which could only have been formed in the ocean. And also from the discovery of similar marine fossils, such as these ammonite fossils, both at the tops of mountains and at great ocean depths. These and other observations led scientists of Wegener's time to conclude that considerable vertical change had taken place in the Earth's surface. But few scientists in the early 1900s were willing to accept that there could be any major horizontal movement of continental land masses. Wegener believed otherwise. He insisted that significant horizontal movement of the Earth's crust had taken place and that this movement had occurred and was still occurring all over the globe. Wegener proposed that about 300 million years ago, all of the present continents were joined in a single supercontinent. He called this giant landmass Pangaea, from Greek words meaning whole Earth. Wegener explained that horizontal movement and the splitting apart of Pangaea led to the origins of the present-day continents. Wegener pointed to a well-known observation that the outlines of South America and Africa matched together like pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. The fit of these two continents was even better when scientists compared the continental margins, areas lying under relatively shallow water just offshore which are considered to be part of the continental landmasses. 
Wegener believed that it wasn't until about 50 million years ago that South America was clearly separated from Africa. He theorized that since the material of the crust was less dense than the material of the mantle, it was reasonable to expect that the crust could float on top. And if the crust could float, it could move. The major difficulty with Wegener's theory was that it did not adequately explain how large portions of the Earth's crust could be moved about. Wegener suggested several explanations, but none were accepted. As a result, the theory of continental drift lost favor with the scientific community. Interest in the theory was revived in the early 1950s as new geologic evidence began to accumulate. Studies of the crust along the continental margins of continents such as South America and Africa revealed the presence of similar types of rocks and minerals. In eastern Brazil and western Africa, rocks with similar grain patterns and minerals with common characteristics were discovered. For example, diamonds of similar shape and size were found in the two areas. These observations supported Wegener's hypothesis that the two continents were once joined together. Studies of mountain ranges on continents now separated by oceans revealed striking similarities in the types and ages of the rocks found there. One example is the Appalachian Range, located along the eastern continental margin of the United States. The Appalachians contain rocks of similar age and formation to those in mountains of Norway, Sweden, Scotland, and Ireland, as well as to rocks in Newfoundland and eastern Canada. When the continents are fitted together, as suggested by Wegener, the mountain ranges of the northern hemisphere and the locations of diamonds and similar rock types in the southern hemisphere line up in what appear to be continuous formations. If, as Wegener suggested, one supercontinent split into separate continents, evidence of the split should be found in the study of fossils, the remains or impressions of ancient animals or plants, such as the trilobite shown here. And indeed, such evidence was found. For example, snail fossils found in Africa and South America proved to be similar in age and type. Fossils of land animals, such as Lystrosaurus, were also found in very widely separated regions. It seemed impossible that the same species could evolve in completely different places at the same time. But the similarity could easily be explained if the areas had once been parts of a single landmass, as Wegener had proposed. Evidence from fossils, combined with that from rock structures, also showed that major climate changes had taken place on several continents. Studies showed, for example, that approximately 300 million years ago, hot, dry deserts existed in the present North Polar region. Conversely, portions of the now widely separated land masses of Africa, South America, India, and Australia were once covered by huge glaciers, suggesting that these areas were then located in cooler latitudes. Glacial rock evidence was also found in Antarctica, suggesting that all these land masses were once joined and covered in part by a huge circular ice cap of a kind that could have formed only near one of the poles. From detailed studies of the ocean floor, scientists made a remarkable discovery. A series of mountain ranges, almost 80,000 kilometers long and three kilometers high, was found running midway through many of the Earth's oceans. These ranges are called mid-ocean ridges. Mid-ocean ridges are composed of segments about 1,000 kilometers long. The segments are separated by cracks in the ocean floor, called transform faults. Running down the center of many of the ridges are deep, narrow valleys called rifts. The vertical scale of the ocean floor, shown partly covered with sediment, is greatly exaggerated for clarity. Studies of the rock material of the ridges showed that the age of the rock increased on either side of the ridge as the distance from the center of the ridge increased. 
This and other evidence led scientists to conclude that new rock was being formed continuously, oozing up from the mantle under the crust and emerging through the rifts of the mid-ocean ridges. Scientists also made a curious discovery about the minerals of the ocean floor. It had long been known that as molten rock solidifies, particles of iron within it become aligned with the magnetic field of the Earth. The magnetic record is then locked into place in the solidifying rock. It was found that the rock of the ocean floor was made up of areas of differing magnetic polarity. These areas occurred in regular patterns on both sides of the mid-ocean ridges. They formed long parallel strips of rock, and each strip had a magnetic polarity opposite to the one next to it. The width of the strips varied from about 10 to over 50 kilometers and ran for hundreds of kilometers. The patterns formed slowly over geologic time and were nearly identical on either side of the ridges. Scientists already knew that the Earth's magnetic poles had reversed themselves many times in the geologic past. And the pattern of the magnetic strips on the ocean floor correlated closely with magnetic reversal patterns found in the continental crust. This led scientists to conclude that the ocean floor contained a permanent record of the change in the Earth's magnetic poles, which was identical to that found in the continents. How could this occur? The magnetic evidence from the study of the ocean floor was organized into a new theory called seafloor or ocean floor spreading. According to this theory, partially molten rock from the mantle continuously emerges from the rifts in mid-ocean ridges. As the molten rock emerges from a rift valley, iron particles within it become aligned in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. When the rock solidifies, the magnetic record of that particular period of geologic time is locked into place, resulting in strips of reversed polarity. As new crust material emerges from the rift valleys, it is carried in a conveyor belt fashion toward the continental margins. The record of this movement is retained in the rocks of the ocean floor. The rocks are progressively older the further they are from the ridges and they form strips of opposing magnetic polarity that reflect the historical reversals in the Earth's magnetic poles. Moreover, these patterns are nearly identical on either side of the ridges. A further study of the magnetic patterns in the rocks of England and other parts of Europe indicated that the Earth's magnetic poles had not only reversed, but had also changed position. A plot of the varying positions in terms of time produced what was called a polar wandering curve. The magnetism of rocks in North America was similarly studied, and a polar wandering curve was plotted for that continent too. Comparison of the two polar wandering curves revealed that the curves had similar shapes, but were displaced from each other. Scientists concluded that since the magnetism of the rocks had been fixed at a particular point in time, the apparent change could only be explained if the continents had moved during the ages through different latitudes and had rotated as they moved. Shown here are the continents as they are believed to have appeared in relation to the equator 270 million and 100 million years ago. When the polar wandering curves of the two continents were superimposed, as they would have appeared if the continents had once been a single landmass, the correlation was very close. It appeared that the continents had not only moved, but had moved as a unit. The evidence in support of Wegener's theory seemed to be conclusive. The Earth's crust indeed appeared to be moving. Let's take a moment now to review the evidence. First, there is the discovery that continental margins share many similar geological features. Second, there is the evidence indicating that mountain ranges on continents now separated by oceans were once part of a continuous range. Both these pieces of evidence support the idea that the present continents are pieces of a single supercontinent, Pangaea, which existed about 300 million years ago. 
This conclusion is supported by the fossil evidence, which suggests that when the supercontinents split apart, the pieces carried with them a common fossil record. There is also physical evidence of climate changes on a global scale, suggesting the movement of the continents through different latitudes. Next is the impressive evidence arising from the study of the ocean floor. The progressively older areas of rock on either side of mid-ocean ridges, with their strips of reversed magnetic polarity, indicate that the ocean floor is in motion, spreading and carrying with it newly formed rock that apparently originates in the Earth's mantle. Finally, there is the evidence of the polar wandering curves. Only continents in motion could account for such a magnetic record. If the Earth's crust moves, it must move in large pieces. To find the boundaries of these pieces, scientists studied areas of instability in the crust, areas in which volcanoes and earthquakes are common. Earthquakes were naturally of great human interest and had already been the subject of considerable study. Their locations had been recorded and plotted by researchers around the world. The resulting pattern of earthquake activity shows definite zones of high frequency and intensity. Some of these zones of high frequency are located on or near continental margins. One is along the western coasts of North and South America. Another lies along the eastern Mediterranean and western Asian land masses. Along the island chains of the southwestern Pacific Ocean is another zone of intense activity. A similar zone is in the island arc area of the eastern Pacific. Not all active zones occur on continental margins. One zone of intense activity is located near the India-China border, well inland. Earthquake activity is also relatively frequent near the mid-ocean ridges of the ocean floor. One region of intense activity is in the island of Iceland, which lies on a rift valley. This rift appears to be a continuation of the mid-Atlantic ridge. Along some of the continental margins, areas of high earthquake activity are associated with two other geological features, high mountains close to the shore and deep ocean trenches just offshore. A familiar example is the Pacific coast of South America. Another is the area running from the southern coast of Alaska to the Aleutian Islands. Volcanoes, such as Mount St. Helens, are indicators of instability in the crust of the Earth, and where there are earthquakes, there are often volcanoes. When the location of volcanoes was recorded and compared to the distribution of earthquakes, the two patterns were found to be very similar. And when the patterns of earthquakes, of volcanoes, of mid-ocean ridges, of coastal mountain ranges, and of offshore trenches are superimposed, they seem to form a single global network. From this evidence, scientists inferred that the Earth's crust was composed of blocks or plates whose boundaries could be located by these geologic patterns. This was the basis of the theory of plate tectonics or plate movement. There are now thought to be eight major plates and from four to 12 lesser ones, although there is still disagreement about that second group. In the Western Hemisphere, the largest plates are the North American, the South American, and the Nazca, which lies off the west coast of South America. Two smaller plates, the Cocos and the Caribbean, abut each other in the area of Central America and account for the intense earthquakes in that region. At the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the North and South American plates meet the Eurasian and African plates. In Eastern Africa and Southwestern Asia, there are several smaller plates. The Somali plate occupies the eastern part of Africa and meets the Arabian plate to the north. The Arabian plate in turn adjoins the Iranian plate to the east. Some scientists think that a small plate or plates form part of Turkey and the Balkan Peninsula. In Southeast Asia, one large plate contains both India and Australia and is called either the Indian or the Australian plate. Millions of years ago, this plate is thought to have collided with the Eurasian plate, creating the Himalayan mountains. 
North of the Indian or Australian plate is the Philippine plate, most of which lies under the Philippine Sea. Further north and west is the China plate, lying under much of China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. To the east is the largest plate of all, the Pacific plate, extending from Japan to the west coast of North America and from the Antarctic Ocean to the Aleutian Islands. It is composed almost entirely of ocean floor. To the south lies the Antarctic plate, including Antarctica and its surrounding ocean. By the late 1960s, most scientists agreed that the theory of plate tectonics provided the most satisfactory explanation for major change in the Earth's crust. But one mystery still remained. What force was strong enough to make the plates move? To solve this mystery, scientists looked once again into the composition of the Earth, particularly in the region of the mantle. In the next part of the program, we will examine the hypotheses they created and the evidence they found. In the last two decades, Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift has gained general acceptance. Wegener proposed that 300 million years ago, all the present continents were contained in a single supercontinent called Pangaea. Wegener explained that horizontal movements and the splitting apart of Pangaea led to the origins of the present day continents. Today, Wegener's theory is solidly supported by a wide range of scientific evidence. Zones of earthquake and volcanic activity have supplied evidence that the Earth's crust is broken up into large plates which move and shift through time. This theory, called the theory of plate tectonics, may prove to be the most satisfactory explanation for continental drift, for the spreading of the ocean floor, and the development of the present continents and ocean basins. Yet many further questions must be answered. Where does the material of the new ocean floor come from? Where does the old ocean floor go? Most important of all, what force is strong enough to move continents and ocean floors? There is still disagreement about the exact nature of the changes in the Earth's surface, so we will try to present as broad a range of views as possible. Earlier in this program, we showed a simplified cross-section of the Earth's interior, containing four main zones, the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. The depth of the crust ranges from 10 kilometers beneath the ocean floors to 30 kilometers in the mountainous regions of the continents. The crust consists of the granite rock of the continents and the denser basalt rock of the ocean floor. Under the crust, down to a depth of about 100 kilometers, lies the top layer of the mantle which, though much hotter than the crust, is in a solid or nearly solid state. This top layer, together with the crust, forms what is called the lithosphere, from the Greek word lithos, meaning stone. The plates of the Earth's surface are in fact pieces of the lithosphere. That is, they contain both the crust and the solid top layer of the mantle. 
Plate tectonics can be described as the dynamics of the lithosphere. Below the lithosphere, running from about 100 kilometers to 250 kilometers beneath the surface, is a second layer of mantle called the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is both denser and hotter than the lithosphere. Unlike the lithosphere, it is not completely solid, but has some capacity for fluid motion. The density of the lithosphere, asthenosphere, and mantle increases in the direction of the arrow. Because the lithosphere is less dense than the asthenosphere, its plates are believed to float, so to speak, on top of the semi-fluid layer below it. The mechanism of plate movement is believed to be based on the fundamental physical process called thermal convection. Thermal convection can occur within just about any fluid substance. Water, heated in a container, forms a simple and familiar example of this process. When water is heated from below, the portion closest to the heat source is warmed, causing it to expand. The density of this water decreases and it rises toward the surface. When it reaches the surface, its heat is transferred to the air. Its density then increases and gravity pulls it back toward the bottom. When the cooler water reaches the bottom of the container, it is reheated and the cycle is repeated. It is this circulatory flow that is called thermal convection. Thermal convection is also believed to take place inside the Earth. The heat for thermal convection is thought to come from the radioactive decay of elements deep below the surface, and the mantle becomes progressively hotter as it approaches the core. The top layer of mantle, which forms the lower layer of the lithosphere, is not quite hot enough to melt under the pressure of the crust over it. Therefore, it tends to remain solid the inner mantle, closest to the core, is much hotter, but is apparently under such great pressure from the layers above it that it too may remain solid. But in the asthenosphere, which lies between the top and inner layers of the mantle, the relationship between heat and pressure is such that its material can become at least partly molten. So apparently, it can behave like a fluid. It is here, in the partly molten asthenosphere, that most thermal convection is thought to occur. The process is very slow, for the material of the asthenosphere is very dense and viscous. But heat causes the material to expand and rise toward the cooler lithosphere. Here its density increases, and gravity carries it back toward the core. The process forms cyclical patterns called convection cells. If thermal convection cells are indeed functioning under the lithosphere, then the measurement of heat escaping from the mantle through the crust should indicate their locations. Heat energy that is measured in this way is referred to as terrestrial heat flow. When terrestrial heat flow measurements were taken around the world, they revealed somewhat higher values in the ocean regions than on the continents. But heat flow at the crests of mid-ocean ridges was found to be much higher than in the other parts of the ocean floor. On the other hand, in deep ocean trenches, the values proved to be much lower than expected. What could account for these variations? Heat flow data were analyzed along with information about the age of the rocks of the ocean floor crust, which are youngest at the ridges and progressively older as they approach the trenches. This analysis provided further insight into the mechanism of convection in the mantle. Mid-ocean ridges are now believed to be cracks in the lithosphere, where the upwelling portion, or leg, of a convection cell meets the ocean floor. Trenches are thought to be areas in which the cooling ocean floor lithosphere returns to the mantle on a downwelling leg. Two main explanations for the operation of these thermal convection cells have been proposed. One suggests that there are several concentric cells in the mantle, and that these systems may run all the way from the lithosphere to the outer core. As indicated by the arrows, the upwelling regions of these deep cells surface at mid-ocean ridges, and the downwelling regions are positioned at the trenches. 
The second explanation suggests that there are convection cells at various levels in the mantle. The multi-layered convection cell system brings warmer, less dense material toward the surface and returns cooler, more dense material deep into the mantle. In either case, the less dense mantle material that rises on the upwelling leg of a convection cell is new. This new material surfaces at the mid-ocean ridges, cools, and becomes new ocean floor crust. The portions of the ocean floor between the ridges and trenches appear to be carried along by the convection current, as on a conveyor belt. Eventually, the oldest ocean floor material reaches a trench, where the downwelling leg of the convection cell carries it back into the mantle. Evidence of several kinds indicates that convection cells in the mantle power this conveyor belt and carry the ocean floor plates toward the continental plates and down into trenches. Part of this evidence came from the studies of ocean floor spreading, particularly studies of rock magnetism. Long strips of reversed magnetic polarity on the sides of ocean floor ridges indicate progressively greater age as the distance from the ridges increases. More recently, in the late 1960s, an effort was begun to collect more direct evidence of the age of the ocean floors. The deep sea drilling project collected samples of ocean floor sediments all over the world. The ocean floors are not simply composed of solid bedrock. From the time they are formed, sediment begins to accumulate on them. The older the ocean floor, the more layers of sediment will accumulate. Furthermore, the age of these sediments can be dated by the fossil remains of marine organisms that they contain. The fossil evidence confirmed and amplified the magnetic evidence. Close to the mid-ocean ridges, the sediments were relatively young, right down to bedrock. But as the distance increased from the ridges, older sediment layers were found. The oldest layers of all were found near the deep ocean trenches. This evidence provided further support for the theory that ocean plates are formed at the mid-ocean ridges, that they are carried horizontally by convection cells in the mantle, and that they plunge under or subduct adjoining plates at the trenches. None of this movement is swift. The data suggest that the rate varies from 2 centimeters per year in the Atlantic to 10 centimeters per year in the Eastern Pacific. But over tens and hundreds of millions of years, it could have brought about the complete recomposition of the ocean floors all over the globe. The deep sea drilling project found no sediment anywhere that was more than about 180 million years old. This may seem to be a long time, but compared to the continents, the ocean floors are younger and have altered much more radically. Rocks have been found on the continents that are at least two to three billion years old. Shown here are outcrops of such a formation. It is known as the Canadian Shield, and it represents the oldest rock in North America. The convection cell hypothesis now seems to be the most satisfactory explanation for plate movement. It also helps to explain some of the observed changes occurring along plate boundaries. The boundaries separating plates can generally be described as belonging to three basic types. The first type is called diverging and is found between plates that are moving apart. Mid-ocean ridges are boundaries of the diverging type. Here, new plate material is formed as the plates move away from each other. One example of such a diverging boundary is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the North and South American plates are slowly separating from the Eurasian and African plates and enlarging the Atlantic Ocean Basin. At various points along this diverging boundary, earthquakes and volcanoes occur. A dramatic example is the Surtsey Volcano, which recently appeared as a new island off the coast of Iceland. Another example of a diverging boundary is a ridge in the middle of the Red Sea, where the Arabian and African plates are apparently separating. The ridge in the middle of the Red Sea is an example of the divergence of two continental land masses to form a body of water. Someday this gap may enlarge further to become an ocean. The second type of boundary is described as converging, 
and is located between plates that are moving together. One type of converging boundary occurs at deep ocean trenches, where ocean floor plates meet continental plates. There are major trenches offshore from the islands of Japan, the Kurils, and the Aleutians, where the Great Pacific Plate, moving north and west, converges upon the Eurasian and North American plates. All these island arcs contain volcanoes, both active ones, like Mount Fuji, and inactive ones. These areas are also subject to frequent and severe earthquakes. The action of converging plates can also force the crust upward to form a mountain range. Perhaps the most spectacular example is the Himalayan mountains, a relatively young range which is thought to have been raised up when the Indian plate collided with the Eurasian plate 40 to 50 million years ago. The third type of plate boundary is known as a transform fault boundary. Transform faults can occur where two plates are adjacent and moving parallel to each other in opposite directions. Perhaps the best known example is the famous San Andreas Fault near the coast of California. Here, the North American and Pacific plates scrape laterally against each other. And here, too, occur frequent and destructive earthquakes. Since zones of earthquakes and volcanoes are mainly located along plate boundaries, scientists speculated that they might provide further evidence that plate boundaries represent the upwelling and downwelling portions of thermal convection cells in the mantle. When earthquakes along the mid-ocean ridges were studied, they were found to originate at depths generally less than 60 kilometers below the ocean floor. Earthquakes of this type are classified as being of shallow focus, referring to their point of origin. Since mid-ocean ridges are diverging plate boundaries, it seems reasonable to suppose that they are the locations of upwelling legs of convection cells, where the release of great amounts of energy could be expected. The downwelling legs of convection cells should also be located in areas of high energy release. Plate boundaries that are located on a downwelling leg are referred to as subduction zones. A subduction zone often occurs at the boundary between an ocean plate and a plate carrying a continent. The ocean plate slides under or subducts the continental plate to form a trench. As the ocean plate plunges under the overriding continental plate, a buildup of lithospheric rock can occur at the interface. Some scientists believe that this rock may be the source of mountains along the edges of continents. The Andes Range, along the western coast of South America, is thought to be the result of such a subduction process. This is an area of intense volcanic and earthquake activity, with a deep trench located not far from the coast. Friction between the subducting ocean plate and the overriding continental plate results in earthquakes at progressively deeper levels along the boundary between the two plates. The subduction process may also account for the volcanoes in this region. As the plates collide, it appears that temperatures become high enough to melt some of the adjacent rock. This molten rock then finds its way up through faults and fissures in the crust and erupts as volcanic lava. We will conclude by summarizing the concepts on which the theory of plate tectonics is founded. First, the Earth's crust and the upper part of the mantle form the lithosphere, which floats on the more dense, partly molten asthenosphere. The lithosphere is composed of from 12 to 20 solid plates. Some carry continents and some only oceans. The boundaries of plates are often marked by zones of crustal change, such as earthquakes and volcanoes. New rock material for the ocean plates is constantly being formed at mid-ocean ridges. There, molten rock from the mantle wells up from below and emerges at the rift areas. It cools and solidifies, and the result is a spreading of the ocean floor on either side of the ridges. An ocean plate colliding with a continental plate subducts or plunges under the continental plate. Where this occurs, there are deep trenches offshore from the continental margin, 
and there may be mountains or island arcs along the continental edge. The high frequency and severity of earthquakes and volcanoes in these areas testify to the intensity of the collision. The collision of two continental plates can produce high mountain ranges, like the Himalayas shown here on the left. These areas, too, are marked by intense earthquake activity. Finally, the forces moving the plates are associated with thermal convection cells located in the asthenosphere of the mantle. These cells well up at the ridges and sink at the trenches. Alfred Wegener's theories have proved to be responsible for a major revolution in our conception of the Earth's history. It seems conclusive to most scientists that the Earth's surface is not immobile and rigid, but is a moving dynamic system with change occurring continually on a global scale. Continental drift, seafloor spreading, plate tectonics. These are the elements of the new view of the Earth's surface. But only time and much further research will reveal whether all the mysteries of its motion have been solved.